All right, let's go right to the phones and uh, and bring in Maurice Claret. As I said, former Ohio State All-American running back, uh, surprisingly drafted by the Broncos in the third round of the 2005 draft. He did not make it out of training camp with the Broncos, however, uh, for various reasons. And uh, Maurice has had some off-the-field problems in his life, but he is turning things around. Now he is uh, speaking at prisons, he is speaking at juvenile detention facilities, and he's speaking at youth football camps. Really turned things around. Maurice Claret joins us on the phone. Maurice, welcome to the show. Uh, welcome. Glad to be on it. Maurice, um, the reason we asked you to be on the show is uh, you have been tweeting quite a bit this morning from your Twitter account about the Aaron Hernandez verdict. And um, if you don't mind, I want to I read a few of the tweets before we ask you any questions. And, and here some of them are uh, from Maurice Claret. Aaron Hernandez is trying to hold it together right now. It's going gone, it's gone to hurt when he goes back to his cell. I know the feeling. Uh, another one you tweeted out, Maurice, can't compare my crimes or sentence to Aaron, but I do know the feeling of thinking I'm about to go to the joint. That's the point I was making. Uh, not agreeing or judging Aaron Hernandez, just sad that all of this exists. And then one more, yeah, it's sad for all families, very sad. Families actually do more suffering than defendant and victim continuous suffering. Maurice, um, very active on Twitter, and um, it's caused a bit of a controversy. Some people are, are coming back at you with tweets of their own. Um, what was your purpose in tweeting, about, tweeting out about the Hernandez verdict this morning? Uh, no, I just, uh, as a, um, you know, like everybody else, I watched it out of curiosity. And, uh, of course, you know, 140 characters isn't the proper form to uh, always get your point across. Uh, you know, sometimes people can't separate content from context. And the, uh, the reality of what I was talking about that I was set in that situation, I was in that situation uh, as, uh, as, as a potential prisoner. And uh, I understand the emptiness. I understand the, the, the days leading up to you actually get sentenced. I understand uh, the anxiety. I understand all those factors, and I understand how they affect you. And so uh, I also understand how, like, when you're sitting there and people are talking to you and you're handed your sentence down, uh, it's just like a, a, a deep level of emptiness, you know what I'm saying? You're trying to hold it together. And so when I spoke, I spoke from that perspective. But, you know, of course, uh, you, you, uh, you, you have the Twitter world. A lot of people don't uh, understand perspective and context and content and how to separate it. But I also spoke into uh, regards to his mother, or, or, or his mother. Like, my, my mother could identify with her because she's seen uh, a bad situation happen in court. And so to see his family suffer with that... Uh, my mother will probably identify with that. Of course, I didn't go to jail for life, and we were, we're not in the similar circumstances. But just speaking through that thing, uh, and it wasn't any disrespect towards the victim's family. It was just from the perspective of being in that situation in particular. Maurice, this is what he paid you. Uh, I, was, uh, I had thought all along when we discussed the trial here that he wouldn't be convicted of murder because I didn't believe without the weapon, without uh, someone being a specific eyewitness, someone rolling over on him, that the jury would be able to yeah. take the dots and put them together, and, and and they found him guilty of everything. Were you somewhat surprised or surprised at all by the verdict? Yeah, yeah, I, I was. Uh, I was surprised going through uh, the court process or going through or, or knowing of so many criminal hearings. Uh, and you know, I understand that you need a lot more evidence and, and, and things of that nature. And so, like, I was like, hey, he's, he's probably got top-notch lawyers. They're probably going through the case and disproving everything wrong, and there's just not a lot. But I think what, what, uh, what weighed heavy in this, and whether we like it or not, or whether people will admit it or not, uh, just a court of public opinion. You know what I'm saying? Whether you wanted to or not, uh, you were exposed to information on Aaron Hernandez prior to that. And then when you heard about the first murder, the second murder, and the third murder, and then you have uh, these, uh, these the, the people just trumping that up, uh, it's hard for you not, or it would be hard for a juror not to believe uh, all of what they've been consumed with. And it's just, you know, just the nature uh, of what it is. And, and unfortunately, he had to be on the receiving end. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it just how, it's how it happened. As Les pointed out, you got some negative reaction when it seemed to me that you were just trying to reach out and, and offer condolences and offer uh, a perspective that maybe most people haven't had who've had to go, to quote you, to the joint. Uh, it may, might just be the, the nature of social media these days, yeah. though. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, but it, I tell you, what, it, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. You know, like, um, 
Like, I don't look for uh, validation through people for Twitter. Like, I don't look for uh, a bunch of retweets to say, hey, I said something cool or good. And it doesn't bother me uh, from from the different perspective. Like, because, like, I, I said what I said uh, based upon my experience. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, everything it doesn't get understood in, the, in, the, in its appropriate context, and I'm fine with that. And that's why you have uh, radio shows, you have national TV shows, and you get on them and you talk it and you explain in further detail and why you said what you said. But that, that's much like everybody else. I've been uh, guilty of not understanding uh, someone before my, myself. So it doesn't bother me. I know who I am. I know what I've meant. I understand my intention. So you know, I've been through worse situations uh, in my lifetime than, than having uh, hate or backlash on Twitter. I think I'll survive. Yes. Uh, I would say in the shadow of what's going on, in a courtroom in New England, another famous ex-running back who was unable to make it in the pros, uh, Lawrence Phillips, was just uh, accused of murdering his cellmate in prison. How, how difficult for those people who haven't served time, who haven't been in there, uh, is it as difficult as most people believe it is, or is it even worse, Maurice? Oh, uh, it, it, prison is a uh, it, it's a very intense environment, and um, just imagine if you ever got into a fight, the, 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 that that feeling that you felt, that intensity, that pressure, uh, to a large degree, when you go into a lot of these institutions, that pressure and that intensity and that level of focusness uh, that you have to have is uh, with you every day, from the time from six thirty when they open the door. Uh, all the way to the end, I've seen guys get attacked at 6 o'clock in the morning when they crack the doors with knives and they get stabbed and they sleep. And I've seen guys right before we locked down at night, you know, I've seen a guy uh, boil some baby uh, oil and water and throw it in another guy's face and lock his cell. I've seen riots happen in prison. Uh, but it's, it's just very intense all day long. And, and, and Lord knows, um, uh, what I, I only, only Lord knows what happened uh, with the situation uh, with Lawrence Phillips. I heard about it. Uh, but, man, you know, you have people in prison to fight over those uh, 15 cent suits. You have people in prison to fight over shoes. You have people in prison that fight over or, or kill each other or stab each other over uh, just subtle disrespect. You have people who fight over washers and dryers, and it's a, it's a completely different world. You know what I'm saying? And it's a, it's a very intense environment, and, um, and, and it has its own set of politics. And, and that's why I get out here now. And uh, like I said, you said at first, you know, I speak to universities, I speak to college kids. I speak to high schoolers, and I do it, um, excuse me, when I'm able to, uh, but not just say, hey, uh, don't go to prison, don't do what I do. That does nothing in the long run, uh, but it's teaching these guys how to think. I think the, the biggest uh, conversation to be had is how, from a high school standpoint, from a, a collegiate standpoint, how are these schools uh, teaching these guys to think better? You know, you don't have a lot of programming in place uh, to develop these guys mentally. You know, they, they, they go on these campuses, they throw them in these lollipop classes, these things do nothing to develop you socially, intellectually, or in any in any capacity. And and as a result, you push these dumb athletes uh, who have a bunch of social equity and social influence out into the community, and they don't know how to manage themselves. You know, so, so you get a lot of this stuff that happens on ESPN, and uh, Jameis Winston did this, or Johnny Manziel did that, or this athlete did this. And it's not to say that these guys didn't do it; it's to say, hey, how can we attack this in particular? You know, if you want a guy to get faster, you'll go get. The, the best strength and conditioning coach or the newest machine, and you invest in that from an athletic standpoint. But when it comes time to uh, allow these guys to think and to uh, to culturize them towards, uh, to, to, not to culturize them, but to develop them uh, outside of their urban culture, in most cases that they come from or just the mentality that they're with, there's not a lot of assistance in that place. And that's one thing uh, that I advocate for because I know when I went to prison and educated myself, my life changed. Our guest is former running back Maurice Claret, and uh, this segment brought to you by the Harmony Foundation. Go to HarmonyFoundationInc.com for more info. Maurice, I don't mean to paint a broad brush here, but I think the question needs to be asked. Um, is there something about a, a young man in his 20s, a football player, um, uh, with money in his pocket, a feeling of invincibility, a feeling of invulnerability that allows an Aaron Hernandez to think he can get away with something like that, to allow a Maurice Claret to think you can get away with some of the things that you ended up in prison for, the, the aggravated robbery and the physical confrontation with the cops, or is it just an individual, an, an individual circumstance here? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you couldn't paint everybody like that because uh, most guys don't feel that way. There's a lot of success stories. Uh, there's a lot of guys. But uh, what we're specifically talking about, you're talking about an instance, and I'm talking about 
uh, a mentality and a mentality that's bred over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm talking about dealing with that and growing the mentality and educate these guys. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when you just understand, when, when you go on the process of self-discovery, you understand your mind, you understand what it is to be a man, you understand how these things look in action, then you're able to make more responsible decisions. Uh, your level of consciousness is a lot clearer than it was at 18 or 19 or when you were kind of leaving, uh, loafing around your neighborhood. Uh, but what happens in a lot of cases, I want you to kind of dissect, dissect what I'm saying to you, uh, so much we go through the process of athletics, right? And the favorite word for all these coaches is what? Hey, Maurice, play the game. Hey, Aaron, play the game. Hey, such and such, play the game. And when you're playing the game and you're acting, you're not really discovering how to use your mental faculty. You're not understanding how to problem solve. And so long, and for so for so long, we get pushed through a system like that, right? And after you're pushed through the system and you remain eligible and you go out here and make all this money, and now you have so much power, all the things that come to your mind you can do, but you're not really conscious of the consequences of everything. You know what I'm saying? So you do things loosely, not really understanding. And like when I, when I did a study on myself, I'm not talking about anybody else, I just wasn't as conscious as to how things could play out. I wasn't conscious as to what I meant to other people. I wasn't even as conscious as I was as popular as I was. You know what I'm saying? I was just functioning like this individual who I grew up in the neighborhood. And it's not like that, that the same thing, like, hey, this guy has a thug mentality. Why does he have this thug mentality? And what can we do with all these people in higher education and all these resources that we have in our life? What can we do to attack this thing? Because we're all influenced. Uh, guys are influenced by some of the some of the same things. You know what I'm saying? I, I kind of lost my train of thought right there, but I, I hope you can get the gist of what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mike Shanahan gave you another opportunity. You came to Denver. It didn't work out, if I remember correctly, and it's gone, gone yeah. back for a while. You were, really weren't in great physical shape at that point to really be a competitive, uh, be in a competitive situation to make the team. Uh, then you got into more trouble. Uh, at what point, you said you the education you got in prison, and I assume that you're talking about self-education. I'm not, ta yes. not talking about, you know, the guys bringing uh, sieves into the dining room. No, but, he, he actually uh, worked towards a degree at Ohio yeah, University while he was in jail. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what made you have the decision? What woke you up? I mean, was it a hammer to your own head from your own hand? Or, I mean, why did you finally say, I got to get it or I'm going to be... I'm going to end up like Ernest, you know, not Aaron at that Hernandez, time, but yeah. Aaron Hernandez or uh, a lot of the other players that have ended up in jail. Yeah, uh, no, no. So what happened was that uh, football was no longer an option, and I understood where I wanted to get in life, and it was just—it was this simple. Uh, it wasn't that I hated reading; I just was not interested in what was presented to me in college. You know, I never discovered what it was that I wanted to become. So when I went to prison, I was like, "Hey, you know, you want to get out of prison? You have a daughter." Uh, you have a, she's my fiance now, but at the time you have a girlfriend, you need to fix this thing because basically I didn't like how I was living or the consequence of the situation. And so from there I was like, hey, uh, and, 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 and please, please put this in context. Uh, when I would sell drugs, I used to hustle before, right? I understood that in the purest form that that was basically entrepreneurship, right? And so I said, how can I use a skill set that I have or the skill to sell things, to buy and sell things? How can this thing be utilized in real life? And, for, and from there, I went on like the self discovery thing. I read about economics, micro and macro. I read everything about finance. And I really got attached to Warren Buffett because he was like the greatest investor. He still is one of the greatest investors, 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 or investors of our time. And uh, reading so much of his material and uh, reading from Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor, and really just doing book reports on the stuff and reading so many magazines on uh, a bunch of finances and stuff, like basically my life had changed and transformed. And I realized that I can take care of myself outside of football. And I gained the confidence, right? And I'm pretty sure that if you teach these guys on who they can become and get to where they want to get to in life outside of the confines of football, that behavior changes. You know what I'm saying? You're not, you're not, um, you're not chasing this dream for 30 and 4 years. And you're not just dependent upon this one vehicle and sort of foreclosing on all your academic opportunities and personal development. You'll start to realize you need different sets of skills to become a professional society. And that's more or less, that's just what I did. There, was, there wasn't anything special. I just found out, that, hey, I can become who I want to become and make the money I want to make. Uh, like right now I'm in the packaging I'm in the packaging industry and in the industrial cleaning industry, uh, and I own a few rental properties. You know what I'm saying? And I do a bunch of speaking on the side, but I've created income for myself, and I've made more money doing business than playing football. And, uh, you know, like, and it's just to understand that these guys have the same ability, but understanding that you have to grow as an individual in order to tap into some of these opportunities. 
Well, Maurice, we're sorry we never got to see you carry the ball for the Denver Broncos. We're very no happy, problem. however, that, that <laughs> no you've become a, a, a better person and a, a solid contributor to society. And, and thanks for joining us this morning. I tell you, thank you for having me, and it's my hope that some educator or somebody who are in charge of these athletes uh, start to challenge them more, man, just to discover who they are outside of the helmet. All right. Thanks, Maurice. And, thank uh, and we do understand what you're saying on your Twitter handle, all right? All right. All right. All right thanks, man. Maurice Claret.